This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Shapeshift.io. With no account or signup required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, counterparty, Dogecoin, Dash, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to Shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Stefan Thomas. He's the CTO of Ripple Labs. And of course, pretty much anybody in the Bitcoin space has heard, or if the, in the cryptocurrency space has heard, heard of Ripple, and so have we many times. But we've never actually had the time to sort of really dive into that. So our knowledge, my knowledge has been very superficial. So really excited that we'll have a chance to change that today. Uh, Stefan also, before he got involved in Ripple, he had sort of a long history in the Bitcoin space. I'm sure some of you will know uh, the website he created, We Use Coins. That was, I think, for a long time, the sort of initial launch path to learn about Bitcoin in two minutes. And he's also the original creator of Bitcoin JS, which is used as a JavaScript library, which is used for a lot of web wallets like blockchain. At least that's what it said on the Bitcoin JS website. So, Stefan, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to, to talk to you guys. And I hadn't realized that you were behind We Use Coins. Uh, just uh, excited. Of course, uh, first one on that website whenever I first got into Bitcoin uh, about a year and a half ago. So, I mean, almost two years ago now. So, awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so I guess that brings us to sort of our first topic, right? So you, you started really early on in Bitcoin. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that? Yeah. So I, I first got interested in Bitcoin in um, mid-2010. Um, and at the time, there was already a, an established uh, sort of community. But, um, you know, things like the Bitcoin price were just brand new things. And you couldn't really, like, there was a little bit of debate of what the price was and, and if, if it had value at all. And, um, there was very little trading going on. Uh, you know, Mt. Gox was just starting out, and so um, it was a it was a very I don't know. It was, it was clear that there was some potential there, and what really attracted me to it was that it seemed to be doing something that, in computer science, I learned you know was impossible. Like you couldn't do um, you know consensus like that, and so um, that attracted me to it, and, and I decided to get more involved and, and see how can I how can I help you know. How did you get the idea to do we use coins? Um, so people had. Uh, there was this one sub forum on Bitcoin Talk, um, which was basically uh, you know bounties or like you know projects that people wanted to to sponsor, um, and one of the largest bounties uh, with uh, over nine thousand, yeah, I know, very meme compatible, over nine thousand bitcoins was the <laughs> um, the animated video bounty. It was nine thousand fifty two uh, bitcoins were actually paid out then. Um, and uh, I grew up with a friend of mine, Fabian, who actually also now works uh, here at Ripple Labs with me. And um, he had uh, he was uh, finishing up his bachelor's degree in motion graphics. And so I called him up. We'd, we'd grown up together. And I was like, you know, do you want to do this video together? Um, and he was like, yeah, I need a bachelor project anyway. And, and so we started collaborating on it. Uh, he ended up deciding to get paid in euros, not Bitcoin, which uh, he still regrets to this day, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> oh, my but, God. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, um, uh, I could have forced him, you know, so, um, yeah, we're, we're, that's kind of how I got started uh, being more active in the community. I started going to conferences. I was at the, what I think most would call the first real Bitcoin conference in, in New York, um, uh, organized by Bruce Wagner uh, back then. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, sp I spoke there together with uh, Gavin and uh, Jeff Garzik um, and, yeah, just got more and more involved. Yeah, that sounds like that was a very uh, profitable uh, project to do that uh, <laughs> website. <laughs> I don't regret uh, anything. <laughs> yeah, so, so what about Bitcoin JS? When did you work on the, that? Yeah, so one of the, the lessons from We Use Coins was, you know, it was a website. It was, like you say, um, the, the most popular Bitcoin website that, at the time, aside from Bitcoin Org. And so a lot of people were coming in because they had seen the video on TV. It was shown on, on a lot of news stations and so on. And so we got a lot of inbound traffic, but very few people converted to, to actual Bitcoin users. Um, and I started looking into, like, why is that? And um, uh, my background is uh, I worked at uh, various web agencies, so I know things like funnels and, you know, marketing. And, um, one of the things that, that um, I noticed was that the funnel for us was just really horrible because you had to download the client and then a lot of people would drop off after they downloaded and installed the client. Um, at the time, it took like uh, three or four days to, to download the blockchain. 
Um, and so it, it, it was a very high barrier to entry for people to actually get into it, especially if you weren't super technical. Um, and so one thing that I thought would help a lot would be to, to do web, web wallets. But one thing I was concerned about is there was this um, website called mybitcoin.com. And it was basically a web wallet that would hold your keys for you. Um, like, uh, you know, there's several out today now. Um, and they ended up running away with like 50% of their users' coins. And so clearly, like, that was not the right approach. And so I wanted to create a library which would allow you to use Bitcoin in the browser, um, but in such a way that um, you didn't, uh, like the website didn't have the keys. The keys were somehow stored um, on your on your local, um, in your local browser. And um, that's kind of always been the, the dream with Bitcoin JS, and, and that's how I got into, into writing Bitcoin software. Mm, cool. And, and where did Ripple come in? When did you start um, working on Ripple? Um, so I, I would say like there's a couple of things that, that um, attracted me to Ripple. So um, actually, hard to think of where I would start. Uh, one of the things that, that was happening sort of in 2012 was that um, I had worked on Bitcoin Jazz for over a year. Um, I was starting to get kind of tired. It was very hard for one person to keep up with um, you know, all the changes and all the new um, things that people were discovering in Bitcoin, all the feature requests and so on. Um, and I had always, almost like this little race going on with my current where um, we would try to get our uh, respective implementations, like him working on Bitcoin JS, me working on Bitcoin JS, we were both in the Swiss community, um, trying to get them to get to feature parity with Bitcoin. And um, it just, it got to it got to a level where I was just like not sleeping, not eating, not drinking, um, and just very, very tired all the time, um, trying to maintain Bitcoin JS and, and keep it up to date. And to be honest, like the, the browser library got very popular, but there's also the big, most of the work was in the server component, which implemented like the script interpreter, mining, all this kind of stuff. Um, and that was a lot of work and not a lot of people used it. And so I started to kind of reevaluate like what I was doing and like what, what you know, what would actually help Bitcoin the most and um, what would help this, this technology the most. And one thing that um, I noticed was that I always had to live off of my, my Bitcoin investment. I knew that a lot of uh, other Bitcoin developers were in a similar situation where they actually didn't have a ton of Bitcoins. Um, you'd constantly hear stories of people who had like a huge stack of coins and uh, you know totally forgot about them. And then they come back and suddenly they're like millionaires. Um, and I always thought that it was kind of weird of how the Bitcoin economy worked. Like all of the, the Bitcoins that get produced um, get largely put into electricity so they go out to electricity companies uh, ultimately and um, don't really benefit the community um, and right at that time i got approached by uh, jeb mccaleb um, who was starting this company called opencoin and uh, i was like you know i was looking at my dwindling you know uh, investment in bitcoin because i had to again, live off of it um, i was looking at you know i want to get a job but i don't necessarily want to get a job but in something that isn't cryptocurrency related um, and so first I, I told him no because you know it, it, it was a pre-mined coin. I didn't wasn't interested in that. Um, but all the things sort of came together in the end. Jesse Powell, who's a, a CEO of Kraken now, I think, mm -hmm. um, he was a good friend of mine, and um, he I had worked with him before. I trusted him. Um, he invited me to come over to California and kind of meet the team of, of OpenCoin and kind of like hang out with them for a little bit. And um, uh, the other person who was an investor at the time was Roger Ver, and obviously I respect him a lot. Um, uh, he, he was a good friend, so. Um, I ended up coming out and I ended up spending some time with the team. And that's when I noticed, oh, holy crap, these guys are really smart. Um, and if, if I've learned anything, it's, it's, it's a good idea to hang out with smart people <laughs> because, um, you know, it rubs off. So um, I, I ended up staying and I ended up moving here. Cause so so that, that was really early on with Ripple, right? So uh, OpenCoin, is that... Did it just change the name to Ripple, or was that a different project? Um, so yeah, it's just it just changed the name. Um, originally, the company was called OpenCoin. The project was already called Ripple at the time, um, and it was actually you know we intentionally tried to keep it separate, but it just caused a lot of confusion. So eventually, we just changed the name of the company to to Ripple Apps, which is what it's called today. And so, how how did this idea come to be? Like the idea of of Ripple uh, with you know, these people that were obviously working in Bitcoin at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that like a lot of the the issues that we saw with mainstream adoption were things like people wanted to use their own currency. There were there were literally companies that I talked to where I tried to get them to accept Bitcoin or I tried to, to get them to deal in Bitcoin. 
but they were like, well, look, we're paying our suppliers in dollars, look, we're paying our suppliers in, in Swiss francs, or you know, whatever the case may be. And they said, you know, we have to accept Swiss francs. And so the only option that you really have at that point was, you know, there were companies like BitPay out there who would convert it for people, right? But then you have like a single. Uh, a single point, like a single company that's giving you the rate and that's converting your points for you, uh, whether it be, you know, bit, I don't want to single out BitPay, but great, doing a great job, I think. But like, you know, do you have the Coinbase, the BitPays? Um, and we didn't like that idea that, you know, the, the entire currency exchange would be controlled by, by that one company. Um, and so one of, one of the ideas that, that uh, we were pursuing early on was kind of this idea of a distributed exchange. So you, you would have like, um, you would just have an exchange network, and if you wanted to get from bitcoins to Mexican pesos or whatever, um, you wouldn't have to go through um, you know, a central um, exchange that gives you one rate and you're stuck with that rate, but rather you could go through um, a competitive sort of exchange market that was on a distributed ledger. And that was kind of like the original idea, I think. Um, and, and yeah, and that was one of the main things. Another thing was kind of mining. Um, so Jed had a big thing about um, you know, mining being, being wasteful. Um, I recently looked at some statistics that um, uh, Bitcoin, when it was uh, at thousand dollars, was roughly putting out something like eight million tons of, of CO two. That's that's more than the, the country of Cyprus. Um, so uh, there's definitely something to be said about about mining as 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 being a wasteful process. And like I think we we owe it to the world, I guess, to to try and find other options if they exist. So. You said the, the original idea was to have a kind of decentralized exchange so you could trade like pesos and, and kind of different currencies. Uh, of course, the question then is, well, how do you have a, a peso on a ledger or a fiat currency on a ledger? Is, is that sort of the next, the next step that then came and it was like, oh, we need to do uh, sort of a blockchain-like mm -hmm. assets? For fiat currencies, or yeah, so you still you definitely still need a custodian. Um, the goal there was to to make the the actual exchange rates competitive, so that you know if if you wanted to trade out of a currency, you could always do that. It didn't depend on an exchange being online. The, uh, the exchanges being DOS was a big thing at the time. So um, again, that that was kind of like what got the ball rolling. The other idea that came into it was. Um, Ryan Fugger's original Ripple concept, which um, he actually, you know, uh, allowed us to do to use the name, um, which was basically this um, this credit network. So you could have like different people could owe each other money, um, and then move that money around. And so all of these things came together, um, and what Ripple then became was essentially a, a graph that describes everyone's uh, financial or credit relationships to each other. Um, and from there, like once you have this very general language to describe relationships, um, we could allow people to use it however they wanted. And the, the most popular model of usage that emerged was kind of what we now call like the, the gateways, which is basically um, you have someone who's the custodian who's, who's holding the funds. Then you have a bunch of people who are market makers who are trading those funds against other assets. Uh, could be XRP, could be you know another gateway's assets, um, and then you have the users who are kind of using that network, and that's kind of what it evolved into uh, circa you know 2013, early 2013. It's interesting because in the Bitcoin space, right, the one of the sort of conceptions about Ripple is oh it's this it's this horrible centralized thing, mm -hmm. but actually the original idea was that oh we we want to do something something more centralized than mm -hmm. what we are seeing happening in Bitcoin with these payment processors? Well, the way I look at it, it's like, you know, I don't mind people criticizing us as being centralized. Like, I, I you know, our official company position is um, we're not centralized because we can't actually change the rules. And that's true. Like, if we tried to do anything that people really didn't like, um, they would just not no longer trust our validators, they would start trusting other ones. Um, but to me, the, the real answer is, you know, that criticism right now is totally valid. I don't, I don't mind that criticism. It's just, um, one day we will we will decentralize. We will uh, add more validators as soon as there are enough good ones out there that we can recommend and so on. And people will start trusting other validators, and the network will become decentralized. Just like you know, when or when we originally started, we were closed source, and people said they'll never open source. It's always going to be closed source, and then we open sourced, right? It's just like we do the work, uh, and we don't mind being hated in the meantime. You know, like hate us all you want. At the end of the day, it's going to be decentralized, and then the facts are going to speak for themselves. So. Yeah, oh, so that that, that 
So that is fascinating, right? So, so the idea is, oh, you, you are centralized today because that gives you, uh, I guess, a control over the, the process of development, right? Because that, that is co currently uh, quite a nightmare in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Like how do we reach a decision on what features, uh, what choices need to be made? So obviously you guys don't have that problem because, well, you guys just make the choices that you find best. And, and it's, then not quite, later. it's not quite that easy. We do have a community to worry about. So, like, uh, I think every choice that, that we make ha is kind of based on like what would people want us to do. Um, and this is kind of like if you're this early, if you're at this early of a stage, you don't have a ton of freedom. That's that's I think what we mean when we say that we're already decentralized. It's like, you know, we, our hands are pretty much tight. Like between what the the government wants and what the community wants, we only have very small uh, area to maneuver. But we use that to to kind of make sure that the core tenants of, of Ripple are still there. Like it's a it's a it's an open system; anyone can use it. That kind of thing. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift. Of course, Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins, and they now support over forty five of the most popular altcoins, including Counterparty, Ripple, Gems, and so many others that I've never even heard of. And they now support. You guessed it, Ether. Since the release of the Frontier launch, Shapeshift has added Ether to the list of supported currencies. And so now you can buy Ether and start building some start contracts on Ethereum. Now there is a small caveat, and this is true for every exchange at the moment, is that it can take up to six hours for you to get your transaction confirmed. But uh, just stay patient and you'll get some Ether and you'll start building some really cool smart contracts very soon. And just as if Ether wasn't enough, they're also doing this cool thing with a gaming company called Spells of Genesis that's putting some of these in-game assets on, on the blockchain. And, and one of those they're selling in a very limited amount, like 25 every week, only on, on Shapeshift. So that's called The Wanderer and it's called Spells of Genesis. So if you're a gamer, if you're interested in that, check it out because, of course, it's a very interesting way to make this sort of fake scarce asset actually scarce by, by using the blockchain. So uh, head over to shapeshift.io and give it a try. We'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So let's get into some of the technical components of Ripple. So there are uh, multiple terminologies here that some people might find confusing. In fact, I do. So, uh, so you have the Ripple protocol and consensus, consensus algorithm, and then you have the Ripple network. And then there's also the company Ripple Labs. So perhaps we can go through these in order. Let, let's start with the protocol. Um, can you describe the different components of the protocol? Mm -hmm. um, so usually we break down the protocol into a number of layers. So there's a physical layer, which is essentially a gossip network um, where different nodes exchange information about um, uh, the, what the ledger is, um, and where the network is at, what people's opinions are, etc. Um, the next layer up uh, is what we call the validation layer. Um, in the validation layer, it's basically a Turing machine that um, uh, it's like a database where uh, people apply transactions in order to move forward in time and, and in order to mutate that state. Um, and that, again, gives you a Turing machine that you can pretty much implement whatever you want on. Um, and then we have another layer on top, which is essentially what we call the application layer, which is basically the actual application that's implemented on this Turing machine today, which is, is kind of this financial network with things like trust lines and, um, and, and XRP and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, there are some interdependencies between the layers. Like, for example, XRP is also used on the layer below as a way to avoid spam um, or like limit spam. Um, but other than that, they are they're pretty independent. So like you could take the, the bottom two layers of the Ripple architecture and build like a completely different system on top. So I, I read the white paper and I wasn't aware of this, but there are different consensus algorithms that uh, solve the Byzantine general's problem. Can you describe how the Ripple consensus algorithm is different than say Bitcoin's algorithm? Yeah, so um, I would say that, that um, if you look at the traditional consensus algorithms that actually, like a lot of them, predate Bitcoin, um, the way that they generally work is that um, they will set, they, they will take a group of nodes, and you know what that group is, and then they'll set a quorum, like a number of uh, nodes that will uh, make a statement. And if you have um, enough statements from enough nodes, you know that there will not be um, another opinion that has as much support as long as your assumption, which is that only um, a certain number of nodes have failed, usually called the, the fault tolerance F. Um, uh, you know that that 
then you're safe, right? Um, and so people have proven algorithms such that um, they provide safety, which means that the network can't fork, and liveness, which means that the network will eventually make progress um, under these assumptions. Like you only have so many failures and you have a, a, a network where uh, messages uh, get delivered after some unknown amount of time. Um, so, so these are some, I think we've talked about some of these on the show before, like is, is like Paxos one of them or, mm -hmm. or um, so Paxos PBFT? Is a, right, so Paxos would be a consen consensus algorithm that's not Byzantine fault tolerant. Um, PBFT is probably the most well-known one that is. Um, and yeah, one of the biggest differences is that um, if you want Byzantine fault tolerance, uh, you just need to add more nodes. Um, so the number of nodes you need for a non-Byzantine fault tolerance system is 2f plus 1, so you need if you want to tolerate one failure, you need two times one plus one, which is three. Um, whereas in a, a Byzantine fault tolerance system, if you want to tolerate one failure, you need three F plus one. So uh, three times one plus one, which is four. Um, so those are just like your your constraints in terms of like how many nodes you need in order to, to gain a certain type of tolerance. Um, now, Bitcoin is kind of interesting because it breaks that model a little bit or it breaks that mold a little bit because um, it it doesn't provide um, uh, safety theoretically, right? Because the Bitcoin network can fork in different directions. It's just that we always pick what pick a winner. We just pick the longest blockchain to like come back to. Um, and so, uh, from a consensus perspective, Bitcoin doesn't provide safety because you you never know for sure that is another another longer chain out there. Um, but in order by but by making this trade off, it gets a very nice property, which is the fact that. Um, you only need a, a simple majority, depending on, you know, yeah. you only need a simple majority to decide um, what the official chain is. Okay, cool. So let's dive into, let's dive into some of these, a lot of questions. So first of all, blockchain, is Ripple a blockchain or not? So, I, I'm not sure if this question makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I would say that, um, first of all, the term blockchain, like, it, it, you know, we're just in the process of defining it, really, right? I mean, um, blockchains didn't exist until recently, so I think it's, it's um, up to, to, to anyone to, to define what they, what they mean by it. Um, we usually call Ripple a distributed ledger, but it's still a chain of cryptographic blocks that refers back to the previous one. So um, I wouldn't blame you for calling it a blockchain. I think one reason to use a different term is we kind of talked about sort of the, the Paxos and consensus um, history in, in computer science. We talked about Bitcoin as a different approach. Um, Ripple is probably closer to the traditional consensus algorithms. The main thing that it does differently is rather than having a known set of nodes up front that is uh, fully connected. So like one way to model PBFT is basically think of a graph of nodes um, and every node listens to every other node, right? And so you basically have a fully connected directed graph, right? Um, and so Ripple would basically be a consensus algorithm that uses similar principles, except it allows the graph to not be fully connected. It, it, you, you have to start thinking about what if this node doesn't use the same set of nodes as everyone else, right? And so um, somewhere between the fully connected graph, which we know is, is proven safe, and the completely disconnected graph, which we know is going to fork, there's going to be a point where um, you have a certain amount of fault tolerance, and that fault, the amount of fault tolerance is going to be decreasing as you remove connections. And so what we're kind of interested in is um, sort of this middle, middle ground. Um, and the reason that's interesting is because the assumption that everyone's going to set their same the same node list is just not a very strong assumption, right? Like if you have a validator, let's say in, in the US, and you have a validator, let's say in Iran, there's a good chance that the US validator won't ever trust the Iranian validator, right? Or they might be forced not to trust them. And so we still want to be able to evaluate the topology of the network and say and say this network is still safe, this network is still live, um, even with the disconnections. Okay, so we'll get to this node list. Thing in just a second, but can you first just walk us through a transaction? So, you know, someone creates a transaction, signs it, submits it to the network, then what happens? Mm -hmm. um, so, when you sign and submit a transaction to the network, um, it would first come in on the gossip network layer uh, and be spread around the network. If it's valid and it's paying enough of a fee and the node that you originally sent it to is confident that it will be included in, in the ledger. Um, after it's spread through the network, um, it will be uh, part of uh, the next proposed set from a lot of nodes. So a lot of nodes that have seen this transaction, they think it's valid. They're going to say, we propose that this should be in the next ledger. 
any transaction that's uncontroversial. So um, is the proposed set, is that kind of like the mempool in Bitcoin? Um, I, I would say it's like, it's one step further because like, it, it first goes into something very similar to the mempool, which is kind of like all the transactions that I know about, right? Um, and then the proposal is more about like, what I think is gonna go into the next ledger. It's like, I actually think this is going in. Um, I could so who sets these criteria? Who sets the criteria for what is a valid note to be a valid transaction to be in the next proposal? Um, so any transaction that pays enough of a fee is uh, syntactically valid. Um, there's no conflicting transactions that I already think are going in. Um, those transactions would be considered uh, likely to go into the next. So the rules are the same for everyone. Yeah, yeah. As long okay. as you run the same software, obviously. I mean, um, you can't stop a single validator from running different software, but that would just be like a faulty validator, essentially. Okay. And so, and so then it gets sent into the to be a proposed uh, transaction in the next uh, page of the ledger. Yeah. So the next step would be um, every validator receives proposals from other validators, and so now you 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 can see what what actually um, people think. Right, and so once you know what people think, um, then you can say, um, "I actually think that this is the ledger that we should construct because these transactions have an actual majority based on the proposals that I've received." Um, and so once that once that's agreed upon, um, that that uh, that ledger will be published. The validation will be published, and then the final step is. Um, every validator will be listening from other validators published ledgers and if they see enough of those published ledgers um, they will they will consider those ledgers validated and they will say okay this is now the state of the network and and we we'll proceed from here um, so that's what the point where you, like for example a gateway would uh, process a deposit or something like that okay so where does for example as you know with bitcoin we have proof of work providing some security what protects the Ripple network from someone, you know, creating all the validator and, and doing something <laughs> funny? Um, so if you think about um, proof of work, like what proof of work essentially says is, um, well, let's actually let's start a little bit earlier, right? So let's think about what is the actual problem we're trying to solve. The problem we're trying to solve is um, the double spend problem. We're trying to make it so that if someone wants to spend their coins, they can only do it once. They can't later change their minds and say like, no, actually I wanted to send it to this other guy. Um, so in order to solve that problem, you need to have some sort of authoritative decision. It doesn't necessarily matter like what the decision is, only that someone is making it. And then after it's been made, it can't be changed. Um, and so if you imagine a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, if everyone was always connected and always online, everyone could just watch the transactions that happen and make their own decision and you wouldn't need any validation or mining or anything. You would just see which transaction came in first and then everyone would see that one first. I'm making some assumptions here. Um, and you would just say, okay, this one came in first, so we'll process this one and we won't process the other one. And you could make a rule like if they come in very close to each other, um, then they'll both invalid or something like that. And so people wouldn't double spend because they'd just be destroying the coins. Now there's one big problem with this. Um, and that, that problem is that people, you know, they join the network later, right? They, they go online, they go offline, um, and they need to somehow resynchronize. And how do you resynchronize? Because um, when you connect to the network, all you see is a bunch of nodes out there um, and you don't know who to listen to. They're going to say, you know, well, this is the state of the network. And someone else is going to say, this is the state of the network. And you don't know if, if um, the majority is just a bunch of, uh, it's just a botnet that's like trying to convince you of, of an invalid state. Um, and so what mining allows you to do is it allows you to say like, well, this state has this much mining power behind it and this state has this much mining power behind it. So essentially, you're not watching the network all the time, but you're trusting that there are other people out there that are watching the network all the time and they're also mining. Um, and so you, whatever they say, you can kind of rely on, okay? Now, um, mining or the proof of work portion essentially acts as a, a proxy for voting rights. So you're giving people voting rights based on um, based on how much they mine. So if you have 70% you know, of the mining power, you have 70% of the voting rights. Um, so what Ripple does by contrast is rather than um, deciding who gets to vote based on mining power, we just tell each individual user essentially or each individual node that connects to the network, you decide who you want to have voting, right? So like if you want uh, to listen to these nodes, just put them in your list and then your software will adopt whatever those nodes say. If you want to listen to those nodes, um, put them in your list, right? Um, and so you're kind of like turning you're making it the, the, the nodes problem or the nodes decision of who they want to listen to. And it gives you some pros and cons. 
Um, so on the pro side, uh, it allows you to um, it allows you to deal with malicious nodes. So for example, if there was a malicious Bitcoin miner that would like never include any transactions, for example, um, there's nothing you can do. It would just be like, okay, well, those blocks are like empty. It wouldn't hurt the Bitcoin network a great deal, but you couldn't. You also couldn't get rid of them. You couldn't shut them down or anything. Um, whereas, like in Ripple, um, what happens is if someone doesn't include any transactions or they always vote no, we would consider them a faulty validator, and so people would take them off the list of validators that they listen to, and so their their voting power in the network would go down. And so you have kind of like the so, ability. So, go ahead. so is there on a client level locally, are there some rules that determine who is a faulty validator? Um, there's no, it's, it, there's no rules. It's completely manual, right? So like the node, each node has to decide who they want to listen to. Okay. So, so if I was running, um, a ripple node and I noticed, so oh, this, per this node is always saying no, then I would like manually go in there and remove yep. them. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's actually kind of, I, I, I don't know how, how deep you want me to go into this topic, but, um, it's actually kind of interesting how, um, ultimately the consensus is based on the code that you're running. Right? Like for example, let's say the Bitcoin developers decided to change the mining algorithm to another mining algorithm um, for whatever reason, let's say you know, SHA-256 is broken or something. Um, then the blockchain that previously would have been considered formally valid, the one that has the most work under SHA-256, would suddenly no longer be valid, it would be a different blockchain that would be valid. And so ultimately the, the trust always lies with, with the developers. The trust is always a manual process, right? Like because the developers define the rules, and then all that mining is, is a shortcut, a um, decision-making framework that's faster than the manual changes, right? Like, mm -hmm. to, in order to get everyone to upgrade their Bitcoin software, it would take a long time. So you need something that, that can react on, on, on the order of minutes. And so that's why you use mining. And so with Ripple, um, it's similar. It's like, we, we, like, there's the developers who make the software, and they decide certain ground rules. Um, and then you have... Um, then you have the people who run the validators and their job is to make faster decisions, right? And so you're kind of like trying to get to a point where you can make faster and faster decisions um, that are less and less secure, right? So P Peter Tal wrote an interesting uh, paper analyzing Ripple and, and I think he brought up uh, a point that I'd like to address here. Uh, and that's the question, you know, can this be really decentralized, right? Because if you let's say I'm running a Ripple node, then what I don't want to do is I don't want to listen to nodes that, you know, do the wrong thing, right? I don't want to listen to nodes that maybe give me fake data or malicious because then I'm at risk of, of losing money or being defrauded or something, right? So doesn't that just mean that there is a really strong... Uh, uh, the sort of Nash equilibrium of this is everyone listening to the same set of nodes and then you have this sort of centralization where you, you don't want to switch away, right? And, and, and I guess that gets even more, um, you know, that gets even stronger because you guys have a, a default, a list of a default node with the clients, right? So I presume most people just download it and stick with default nodes. Mm -hmm. So um, how is how is that ever going to be uh, decentralized? So it depends on what people are actually trying to optimize for. Like if you're if you if decentralization gives you some major benefit, then you are going to choose a list of nodes that is that is decentralized. You know, um, and whether you call that Ripple or you call that some fork of Ripple, right? Like you would choose whatever um, network has the properties that you're looking for. So if you think that a decentralized network is better than a centralized one, um, you would choose a list of validators that also buy into that. The other thing that, that will influence your decision is like the people that you're trading with, what have they decided? What network are they on? Because you want to be on the same network uh, in order to be able to interact with them. Um, the other point you mentioned was um, the, the fact that there's a default list. Um, we don't think that the, that the default list will be static um, in you know, one year, two years. Um, we think that, the, that we'll build, or we are already building tools that allow you to um, build a list based on um, validator uptime, again, the, what your trading partners, whose validators they are listening to, and so on. So um, very soon we'll have the kinds of tools that allow you to build your own list and, and put together your own list. Still though, it, it seems to me that for this to be, for this to be truly, or, or sort of, achieve a high degree of decentralization, right? You'd need to have, first of all, you need to have a, 
a fair number of different nodes, right? Maybe it doesn't have to be huge, but probably a hundred or more. Mm -hmm. And and then some, huh? I don't know if you need a hundred nodes to be decentralized. You need enough nodes so that collusion becomes impractical. And I think that that number is probably a lot lower than a hundred nodes. Like, would you consider Bitcoin decentralized? Bitcoin right now is controlled by by roughly four nodes. Yeah, no, I mean, I think Bitcoin certainly has a problem with being too centralized. And I don't think that's a good thing for Bitcoin at all, right? I think Bitcoin should be more de decentralized. I don't know. I think it's, it's you, you have to think about, like, what are you trying to get out of the decentralization, right? And, and something isn't, like, decentralization is not a goal in of itself. The goal is security. The goal is access. The goal is, uh, you know, the rules come first and no one can, no one's above the rules. That Those kinds of ideals, I think, are, are what we're trying to achieve. Um, and I think that people will be attracted to whatever networks provide them with those benefits. And uh, I think that with this like approach of like manually choosing the, the validators, what we're creating is a system where um, it will just end up with whatever people prefer. Because we, we will try to provide the, the kind of network that people want, and then people will opt into the kind of network that they want. So even if we screw up and we don't provide the network that people want, people will just go onto a different network that does have what they want. Um, it's just important to understand that what people want isn't maximum decentralization. You know, it's not that you want to be on a network that has like a billion nodes and, and the work is replicated a billion times. You want to be on a network that is secure, that gives you access, um, you, have, you have confidence about its continuity, those sorts of things, right? So you, you always have to come back to what are you actually trying to get out of the decentralization. And, and this is why people hate you on Reddit, my friend. <laughs> this, <laughs> is the, <laughs> <laughs> this type of talk, man, you, you gotta... No, it's just, uh, but, so is there an incentive to run a node then? Is it, is it purely just to contribute to the network or do nodes get paid in some way? Um, so you already have to run a node if... Uh, you want to do uh, anything interesting with Ripple, like if you want to listen to transactions and so on, you have to connect to some node. Um, and so you can either run one or you can connect to someone else's node. And of course, they'll, they might charge you for that or they might restrict your how many things you can submit and so on, uh, how many queries you can do. Um, and so there's already a strong incentive to run a node if you're a participant. And then whether or not you publish validations is literally just a flag. It's just a switch that you flip. Um, and so we... What we observe in practice, so a lot of the, the businesses that are on Ripple, they also publish validations and we're starting to track you know, how, how good their validators are um, in order to be able to start to decentralize. Um, and then also, or to, in order to be able to start to add them to the, to the, to the recommended node list. Um, and so it's, it's, I don't think there needs to be much of an incentive. And one nice thing about not having an incentive is that you avoid a lot of the, the attacks that are based on um, trying to get the incentive. So like if you think of selfish mining, other things that, that um, are issues with Bitcoin, um, those all come back to the fact that you get incentivized for mining. Um, and so if you don't get incentivized for, for validating, um, there's actually there's some benefits to that. And so right now, this is the approach that we're taking. But obviously, you know, this could change if, if our assumptions turn out to be wrong. Today's magic word is WAVES, W-A-V-E-S. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So... We've talked about uh, decentralization from sort of a node level, but another, I mean, of course you can talk about decentralization from all sorts of perspectives. Mm -hmm. One is also the software you run, right? As, as you mentioned, which is of course super important. So with Ripple, is it correct that there's only one implementation and do you think this is a problem? Would you like to see other people develop other Ripple implementations? Okay. so. The answer is going to get a little technical, but um, one thing that, that that was one of the innovations in Ripple originally is that um, it validators don't just validate the history of transactions um, like they do in Bitcoin, but they also validate the current state of the network. Um, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to build lightweight clients that don't trust um, the nodes that, that they're talking through. Um, they can literally see what their balance is, they can see... Um, what their, their state of their trust lines is, etc. And they can cryptographically verify that against the, the top hash of the current ledger. Um, uh, what that allows you to do is you can be a lightweight node. Um, and as long as you have your own trusted node list, you know exactly what those trusted nodes are saying. And so you don't have to trust anyone else um, along the chain. 
Um, and the reason that that's, that that's important um, is that there are several implementations of those client libraries, right? So like if you have um, uh, RippleLib, there's a RippleLib version in JavaScript, there's a RippleLib ver version in Java, there's obviously the RippleD implementation, C++. So there are a couple of different implementations of that logic. Um, now, we, we, there's still some things missing with the, with the validation logic there, but um, in principle, you could add that to those implementations if you care enough about that. Um, on the validation layer, it's true, there's only one RippleD validation uh, implementation that validators actually run. Um, but that's the same is true as with Bitcoin. So I think something like 99% of the mining power is actually the, the Satoshi uh, Bitcoin uh, original implementation. And that's a problem. Like, uh, that's a problem for, for both networks, I think. And um, one of the things that we think is going to ha have to happen long term is that there have to be multiple implementations. Uh, but it's very hard to do that. And like, one of the reasons that people uh, don't run alternative implementations in Bitcoin is because you risk that if there's any difference in that implementation, suddenly you're on a, on a side chain, right? So let's move on to, uh, I guess, a higher level above uh, the consensus protocol and the algorithm and some of the technical components that are at the core of uh, Ripple, uh, which are gateways. So uh, we've mentioned them early on in the show. Can you explain exactly what a gateway is? Because it seems to me from my understanding of it that it's very similar to a Bitcoin exchange, but I understand that there are some differences there that are kind of important. Mm -hmm. um, so... I kind of uh, mentioned gateways as as like uh, uh, we were talking about the early days of Ripple, kind of where we started out. One thing that that has evolved into is like, well, who are the best gateways? They are uh, banks, and even better, the central bank, right? So the bank central bank is like the ideal gateway, right? Because um, they can actually issue real dollars, they can actually issue real euros, and so on. Um, and so as as we've evolved as a company, um, our focus has shifted away from. Um, people who are non-banks or non-bank financial institutions um, over to, to banks, credit unions, um, corporates, and so on, who have um, the kind of scope in order to be able to issue um, in order to, to, be issue, to issue real dollars and, and, and FDIC insured dollars and those kinds of things onto the network. Um, and that's right now our current focus. And uh, one thing we found is that for them, surprisingly, I think, you know, we get, uh, we get, uh, ripped off by the banks, but obviously the banks get ripped off by other banks. So um, we actually found that they have a very, very compelling value proposition in adopting this technology, especially smaller banks do, um, in order to be able to do real-time international transactions. And so our focus has pretty much shifted to um, financial institutions now. And um, we just found that that yeah, it's a slam dunk story. They really like this. Um, you know, they, they want to... They like the certainty that they get from being able to see where the transactions at. They like competitive effects. They like the speed of the network, um, and so that's been been our focus more recently. Um, the issue with the with the community gateways was always the licensing, right? It was very hard. It's very hard to operate a community gateway, and it's very hard to do so um, in a profitable way. Okay, so so that was interesting. I I don't know if you want to dive into into the um, the application a little bit more right now, but perhaps this, this would be a good idea. So, so you mentioned, uh, so banks use this for international, international transfer. So can you talk a little bit more about how exactly that works? Sure. So, sure. so, so any bank can just issue, for example, Ripple euros and, and then why would I accept that as another bank and, and why is that? Better? So the way that international transfers between banks work today is uh, through the system called the correspondent banking system. Um, and it's kind of this disjointed um, hodgepodge network of different banks having correspondence relationships with each other. Um, so if you go to a, to a small mid-sized bank um, and you tell them, do you want to make an international wire transfer? Um, what will ultimately happen is that they will send the money to a larger bank in their country um, there's only really a few banks internationally that have those international correspondence relationships. Um, that correspondent will uh, talk to its correspondent in the other country, and then that correspondent will forward it to the final receiving bank. So that's kind of the usual flow. So um, you'll go through at least uh, two intermediary banks before you get to the destination. Um, there's very little transparency with that. So if you make a swift transfer, um, we've had, like I interviewed one guy who, who was an entrepreneur who had started a company in Singapore. He had sent the, the founding capital over to Singapore and it just never arrived there. Um, and then he went to his bank and he was like, 
what, what's up, where, where did my money go? And they're like, well, we sent it off to our correspondent. If you want to know what happened, we can investigate for you, but it'll be, it'll be $40. And uh, <laughs> that's just, you know, adding insult to injury. And uh, banks realize this, and especially smaller banks would love to provide a better service to their customers. It's just that, um, you know, they get the product that they get from the, the their correspondent, and, you know, no one's really in a position to fundamentally improve the system. And so um, wh when we were looking around the, the market um, in 2013, we kind of noticed this this huge opportunity a huge problem with uh, with correspondent banking um, and noticed that Ripple was like the perfect solution right you could just um, as a bank you become a, um, an issuer on the network um, you issue dollars if you're a US dollar bank if you're a bank in Europe you might issue euros um, and then people can come in uh, market makers can come in uh, which could be you know either individual traders or it could be um, hedge funds, it could be investment banks and so on, um, who have very competitive FX rates and they can exchange between um, the dollar assets from one bank and the euro assets from another bank, right? And so that way um, you create this sort of global network where banks can send money to each other directly. So on the one hand, you have this disjointed network, which is the international banking sector where it's very complex to send money from one country to another. Uh, and on the other hand, so what Ripple is proposing is a system where essentially Ripple acts as the channel where banks can send money uh, between each other. But who, so for example, if I want to buy some Ripple Euros, who created that asset? Can anybody just create an asset called Ripple Euros? And is there only one? Are there multiple ones? Like, can you explain that? So when we say, um, ass when we talk about assets on the Ripple network, usually the way we um we express them is is not Ripple euros, but uh, you know, for example, Fido euros, right? So um, if you have a, a bank that is issuing an asset on onto the network, it is that asset issued by that entity, and that that forms an asset on the on the chain. Um, and so people create markets between different assets. Now, if you have a bunch of people issuing euros, since there is the SEPA network that allows you to settle between these different assets. Um, there's arbitragers who just um, they 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 almost trade these things one to one because they know that they as soon as they they've traded them one way they can just send it back to through this the SEPA network and then rebalance their 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 holding. So um, what ends up happening is that all of the different euros end up being worth the same, and so on the network you can you can send them around at, at basically zero cost, um, but at the same time they're still the risk is still localized to that particular bank or that particular um, issuer. So, so if I'm, I may sort of rephrase that. So let's say I wanted to send some money to you in the US, right from Germany, I want to send some euro to you. Then you know, before it was like, I, I, send it, I tell my bank to send it, they send it to another bank that sends it to your correspondent bank and they charge us a lot of money, it takes a lot of time. Whereas with Ripple, uh, my bank creates uh, those euros, the uh, Ripple euros, and then the idea is that somebody uh, has is arbitraging that, and then buys that euros and maybe sells some Ripple USD that and then sends it to your bank, and and that is a lot cheaper than going through these correspondent banks and faster. Exactly. Is, is so that? So, so I mean, a part of that is set up, right? Like the bank issuing assets that, that happens ahead of time. Um, people uh, proposing orders to trade these different assets for one another, that's something that happens uh, at, ahead of time. Um, when someone actually makes a transaction, it goes essentially straight through from one bank to the other. And within Ripple, there is a, a pathfinding algorithm which basically finds like the, the cheapest um, set of conversions that you could go through. So if it's direct, it'll just go direct um, if there's an order book between those two exact assets. If they're two less liquid assets, it might go through some more liquid asset like, you know, dollars or Bitcoin or whatever, um, or XRP, and then get to the, to the receiving asset. So what role does XRP play in all this? Um, so XRP uh, has two, two main roles. One is um, it acts as a, um, a fee so that we can uh, we have some neutral way of charging people for making transactions. Um, so one of the issues, if if um, we used any other asset, you know, all other assets have some issues. So that issuer can create as much of that asset as they want. Um, so we can't use it as a fee. Um, and so one reason that there's a built-in cryptocurrency is so that 
that's a neutral fee. That's a fee that we know is worth something. No one can create any, um, and so no one, including ourselves, can can spam or DOS the network um, just by uh, creating more and more XRP to 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 um, spam. Um, the other main reason, or the other other main objective for XRP, is to make it a liquidity asset. So um, it's basically I, I kind of mentioned these different paths. Um, so we specifically encourage market makers to to make paths through XRP um, in order to create a, a liquid uh, market through XRP. And uh, one of the reasons that that's attractive, or one of the reasons that, that we want that to happen, um, of course, aside from it benefits us, it, it, it's how we fund the company, um, it's also something that like, if, if there was a neutral cryptocurrency out there that a lot of liquidity went through, um, we would live in a world with, with just much lower FX rates because anyone can just connect to that cryptocurrency as opposed to, to having to go through dollars and then being at the whim of whoever issued those dollars. I mean, that's kind of what happened with Bitcoin and the altcoin market, right? I mean, most yeah. of these altcoins don't have any liquidity between each other, but only versus Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. Okay, no, so that makes sense. So I, I think that brings us precisely to uh, Ripple Labs as a company. So is a business model that you guys own a lot of that XRP because you know oh, it was like pre-mined, so so you had that in the beginning. So now you sort of try to make the network valuable and then hope that the XRP will appreciate in value, and, and that's that's the kind of the path to prof to insane wealth? <laughs> um, so the, the thing with XRP is that we're probably not going to get rich with it. Um, the, the issue is that just like me, you know, working on Bitcoin Jazz back in the day, I had a huge stash of Bitcoins, but if you live off of it, that stash tends to get, you know, smaller over time. Uh, and you tend to have to sell a lot before it, it, it appreciates a lot. Um, and so the same same basic thing is happening with with Ripple. I mean, we're we're the number two cryptocurrency now behind Bitcoin. Um, but even so, like we are already we already spent a, a good chunk of our XRP and, and gave a good chunk away. So um, it's it's foreseeable that after um, I don't know another 10, 15 years or so, um, we may run out or we may run very low on XRP. And so we are already looking for um, other ways to to raise revenue. And one of the things that that's very attractive right now is just that um, you know banks want to pay us to help them integrate because. Um, they want to have a service level agreement. They want to have guarantees. They want to have someone they can call if anything goes wrong. And so um, it's actually, we found that banks are more willing to integrate with Ripple um, if you charge them, uh, um, uh, charge them for it, right? So um, those are new revenue streams that are opening up for us and uh, that allows us to, to kind of transition off of XRP and, and make that more of a, an asset that's independent of us and, and where we are just one of many, many holders as opposed to like a, an important holder. No, that makes sense. And I mean, I think that having that several subtle agreement for banks is something that will probably be desirable for 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 corporations now. But with regards to use cases, uh, are the use cases strictly limited to sort of banks and large institutions and large corporations using this? Or can anybody use extra like other use cases for consumers, basically, or uh, you know, small, and medium sized businesses? Um, so I would say the enterprise use cases are the most interesting for us right now. Um, as you know, there are many cryptocurrency companies that are going after consumer use cases, and you know I wish them the best of luck. Um, if we are very successful and we grow uh, and we have the bandwidth, we're definitely going to go after other things. So we're gonna, you know, whatever we think is the the most uh, the most attractive thing to to build next. Um, right now, the most attractive thing for us to build, based on how we're positioned, what our you know strengths are, the way that Ripple works, is just banks are, are our most attractive customer right now. But the, I'm not saying that that will always be the case. So, one potential competitor one could imagine to what you guys are doing. So, it, it, Ripple makes sense to me, right? If I want to have USD on on a blockchain, right? Then what you guys are doing is sort of the one obvious way to do it. But I know a lot of people are also trying to find a way to create this sort of synthetic assets that, uh, you know, like track the value of a dollar without being backed by someone. Mm -hmm. Is that something uh, you worry about? And do you think if that does actually work out, that would be a, a strong alternative to the Ripple approach? 
Um, so I would say that probably, the, obviously the best kind of dollar is a central bank issued dollar. So if the Federal Reserve adopts uh, one protocol or another, um, that would be the non ultra. It would be the best for the banking customers, it would be the best for end users. Um, and so that's, we, we feel in a position to pursue that. Now obviously, um, you know, that will be a long-term project, um, but it's one of the things that I think is going to have to happen for cryptocurrency to really go mainstream. Um, as for these other approaches, um, I, I, I think fundamentally, if you want to hear my personal opinion, this is not necessarily the company's opinion, but my personal opinion, um, I think that any asset that is not fully backed by um, what it says on the can is, um, is going to have trouble because people can't call that bluff. It's kind of like a bank doing fractional reserve, right? As soon as people lose confidence in that asset, it could be a run on the bank, um, it could be a run on that asset. Um, and then, yeah, the fact that there isn't enough of that asset backing it will be exposed. Um, so I personally think that the best way of doing it is is um, having, if you want to have dollars, you can have dollars that are backed by one particular institution, then that risk is localized, you know exactly what that risk is. Um, and if you want to make a synthetic asset on top of those, you can do that. And you can do that on Ripple today if you want. You can create an account that has trust lines with different um, gateways. Um, and issues its own dollars um, that are backed by those different gateways. So that's something that oh, that's cool. that's super cool. So you you can you can sort of uh, diversify the risk by by issuing you know Ripple dollars that are backed by a whole variety of different issuers. Yeah, if you want to do that, you can do that. I mean, right now, if I'm if I'm totally honest, like we don't have the diversity of of, uh, of live gateways that you could. Like seriously, do that. Um, also, I think that honestly, for most people, the risk that their bank will collapse, and if it's FDIC insured, you know, FDIC will not pay out is is pretty negligible. So I think um, I'm not sure how much of a benefit there actually is in, in doing that. Um, but yeah, you, you totally could. And I think with uh, Ethereum coming online, with like other smart contract solutions coming being out there, um, yeah, you can do a lot of cool stuff with these type of cryptographic assets. So. There's another story we wanted to talk about recently. There was some news that Ripple got fined by FinCEN. Uh, I think that the fine itself was not actually that interesting. I mean, if anything, it was sort of worrying in terms of how aggressively they seem to go after what seemed to me a fairly minor thing, mm -hmm. which was, I guess you guys didn't do like proper KYC on when you sold some XRP. But uh, what was more interesting was that it was also mentioned that you guys would have to start doing some transaction monitoring across the Ripple network. What's going on with that? Um, so, so there were several things that they asked for, obviously. Um, and so, you know, as part of the negotiation, one of the things that, that was a big goal for us was to make sure that um, we weren't forced to, to change the protocol in, in, any way, in any way or like triple the protocol. Um, so we achieved that goal. Uh, most of the um, things that we are uh, now required to do are related to our hosted wallet, which is Purple Trade. So for example, we have to KYC our users, um, we have to file suspicious activity reports and so on. Um, and other than that, we are only monitoring sort of the public data. So the Ripple is a public ledger, just like Bitcoin. So there's a lot of data that's available just to the public. Um, and so we, we are building monitoring tools and, and tools that can analyze that data for um, a, on behalf of regulators. Cool. So how, how is the, the traction of Ripple? Are, are you guys making a lot of headway with setting up banks like that and, and setting up that kind of network? Um, so obviously I can't talk about any um, partnerships that aren't announced yet. Um, in terms of what we've announced, we've announced several banking partnerships uh, with FIDOR, CBW, Cross River. Um, there are other uh, networks that are exploring Ripple. Um, uh, there would be Western Union, Earthport. Um, and so we are working with a lot of different uh, companies behind the scenes. One thing uh, that's always an issue is, is kind of the, if you want the stigma of, of cryptocurrency, um, kind of uh, people still associate it with risk and it's very new. And, and so they only dip in a toe, one toe at a time. So um, a lot of these partnerships right now are in a proof of concept status. Um, and as long as those proof of concepts go well, we have a very robust pipeline. But, but is, the, is the kind of outcome that you guys need 
to really sign on a huge number of banks so that it, it really sort of becomes this universally used uh, system to move value around? Or is this also something that can work on a smaller scale and in some niche markets? Um, it's interesting. So th there's actually a couple of things I would say to that. One is um, there are a lot of countries with uh, efficient local systems. Um, I, I think uh, the, the EU area is a great example with SEPA. So uh, within those systems, there's already a lot of uh, progress being made towards real-time systems and, and very efficient low-cost systems. And so if you have one institution in that area, you can pretty much debit and credit any account in that area. And so um, our initial goal for the next few years is only to get um, very robust, solid banks in uh, all of the key payments areas, right? So all of the key countries and, and payments areas around the world. Um, if we achieve that, then we can pretty much already serve most payments and, and, and move money internationally, um, especially if we also build all liquidity between those, uh, between those corridors. Um, the other thing I would say to that is that um, Ripple is just one network. Um, there are many others out there, and I think also in the Bitcoin community, there's a lot of um, interest in building networks that uh, were, were just kind of like fiat, uh, Ripple style fiat issuance and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that one thing that we'll try to work towards is to tie those together with, with our network as well so that um, it becomes more of this like, you know, global cryptocurrency marketplace um, as opposed to. Um, as opposed to like different networks competing with each other. Um, and in order to, to achieve that, we're um, participating in the W3C um, uh, Web Payments Interest Group, um, which is uh, kind of, right now it's looking more at uh, retail payments, and uh, later this year we're going to try to start a community group around web settlement, which is essentially that idea that, that I just mentioned. Can, can you talk about that, the W3C, W3C uh, payment group? Yeah, so the, the web payments group, um, it started as a community group uh, several years ago. Um, it recently, um, I think it's about a, about a year now, uh, turned into an interest group. Um, I won't go into the difference. Uh, basically, an interest group is a group of industry participants. Um, right now, it's a few banks. It's uh, Walmart, Apple, Google, um, a number of tech companies um, who are looking into better ways of doing uh, payments on the web. Um, and within that, since again, there are some banks in there and, and just ourselves in there, um, there are a couple of people who are interested in web settlement as well, which is basically like after you've made the payment, um, does it go through the credit card networks or does it go through um, uh, another network? Um, and so right now, uh, the idea is to add uh, Bitcoin as a scheme to this, but we're also interested in, in, in adding a new uh, a new scheme that can go through through different networks. And um, that's kind of what we're working on right now. And, and hopefully we'll have more to show um, uh, by TPAC, which is the next major W3C meeting in October. Excellent. Well, uh, Stefan, thanks so much for coming on. It, it was really interesting, really enjoyed this and enjoyed learning more about Ripple. Awesome. Yeah, I, I love talking to you guys. And uh, yeah, if you ever have me on again, I, I'd be happy to. Yeah, no, no. I think that I think that would be cool. There's some some stuff we didn't get to talk to uh, talk about, especially code years and, and and some things in this direction. But yeah, maybe we'll do that another time. Cool. I definitely feel that I'm more confident now when people ask me what I think about Ripple to at least be able to explain it a little bit. Yeah, no. I also I also feel my level of uh, knowledge has clearly increased in the last hour, so I'm very grateful for that. There you go. <laughs> um, so. Actually, let me ask you one last question just before we wrap up. So, you know, you, you had such a long history in Bitcoin and, and now you're in Ripple. And when you, it, it seems like in, in the Bitcoin community, uh, there is a lot of negative views about all kinds of projects that aren't Bitcoin. Uh, you know, whether I'm, I'm here in the office with uh, the Ethereum guys, you know, they, they definitely uh, feel that, you know, and... And I just joined Ares, and I'm sure there's some things there. And, and so this, it's an, and of course, Ripple, you guys are perhaps the favorite target of. Uh, so how, how do, you, do you feel about that? Do you feel people are just misunderstanding it? or? Um, when I think about it, I'm not in this to be popular, so I don't really care and or register it. I mean, haters going to hate, what are you going to say? You know? Yeah, OK. No, that's, I think that's probably the best <laughs> way to think about this. Okay, well, uh, Stefan, thanks so much for coming on. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really a pleasure. Cool. So, uh, also, uh, one last thing. So, we've started this new bribing contest in which, like, once a week, 
if you leave an iTunes review, we will give a, a teacher to, to one of the people. Now, you can leave a review saying that we are clearly uh, banking operated robots controlled by Goldman Sachs for having, having Stefan on and talking about an evil project like Ripple. Or you can say this is the best hour you've ever had in your life and you've never learned so much. Uh, either way, it gives you equal chance to win, uh, to win this T-shirt. So, uh, yeah, check that, uh, check that out. And, and if you actually, if you do leave one, then send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com so we know who you are because we can't figure it out otherwise from iTunes. Uh, so, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. So we put out new episodes every, every Monday. You can, of course, subscribe to it on uh, iTunes, your favorite podcast app, SoundCloud, or get the video on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash the And yeah, that's it. Then we look forward to being back next week.